Hi everybody, Mrs. Ghoul, Ghoul School again. We're on the Black Cauldron. We're going to read chapter 14. If you remember when we left off, Taryn and his friends were stuck to the Black Kraken um, through some sort of enchantment, obviously. And they were trying to steal it. And now as they grabbed onto the edges of the cauldron, they're stuck. They can't let go. And Ordu was approaching. Chapter 14 is called The Price. Ordu, blinking sleepily and looking more disheveled than ever, stepped inside the chicken roost. Behind her followed the other two enchantresses, also in flapping night robes, their hair unbound and falling about their shoulders in a mass of snarls and tangles. They had again taken the shape of crones, and in no way resembled the beautiful maidens that Taryn had spied through the window. So crones, enchantresses, um, witches, these are all synonyms for each other. Ordu raised a sputtering candle over her head and she peered at the companions. Oh, the poor lambs, she cried. What have they gone and done? We tried to warn them about that nasty crocken, but those headstrong little goslings wouldn't listen. My, oh my, she clucked sorrowfully. <laughs> now they've got their little fingers caught. Don't you think, said Orgosh in a croaking whisper, we should start up the fire? Orgosh, of course, always wants to eat everything, so she wants to eat them even now. Ordu turned to her. Oh, do be silent, Orgosh, she cried. What a dreadful thought. It's much too early for breakfast. Never too early, muttered Orgosh. Oh, look at them, Ordu went on fondly. <laughs> they're so charming when they're frightened, like birdlings without their feathers. You tricked us, Ordu, Taryn cried. You knew we'd find the cauldron, and you knew what would happen. Why, of course we did, my chicken, Ordu replied sweetly. We were only curious to find out what you would do when you did find it. And now you found it, and now we know. Taryn struggled desperately to free himself. Despite his terror, he flung back his head and he glared defiantly at Ordu. Kill us if you choose, you evil hags, he cried. Yes, we would have stolen the cauldron and destroyed it. And so shall I try, for as long as I live. Taryn threw himself furiously against the immovable Kraken, and once again with all of his strength, he tried vainly to wrestle it from the ground. Oh, I love to see them get angry, don't you? Orwen whispered happily to Orgosh. Do take care, or do advise Taryn, or you'll harm yourself with all that thrashing about. We forgive you for calling us hags, she added indulgently. You're upset, poor chicken. You're liable to say anything. You're evil creatures, Taryn cried. Do with us as you will, but sooner or later you shall be overcome. Gwydion shall learn of our fate. And Dalbin, yes, yes, shouted Gurgi. They will find you, oh yes, with great fightings and smitings. Oh, my dear poets, replied Ordu. You still don't understand, do you? <laughs> evil, why bless your little thumping hearts. We aren't evil. Well, I should hardly call this good, muttered the bard. Not at least from our personal point of view. Well, of course not, agreed Ordu. We're neither good nor evil. We're simply interested in things the way they are. And things the way they are at the moment <laughs> seems to be that you're caught by the Kraken. And you don't even care, cried Eleni. That's worse than being evil. Well, certainly we care, my dear, said Orwen soothingly. It's not that we don't care in quite, it's that we just don't care in quite the same way that you do. Or rather, care isn't really a feeling that we have. If you remember, we talked about antagonists and protagonists, and we were keeping our list of which was which. Where would you put or do or when and or gosh? They're kind of telling us they're neither good nor evil. They're neither protagonist nor antagonist. They are just in the middle. They're interested in um, just kind of seeing what happens. So, Come now, said Ordu, don't trouble your thoughts with such matters. We've been talking and talking and we have some pleasant news for you. Bring the crocodile outdoors, it's so stuffy and eggy in here. And we'll tell you. Go ahead, she added. You can lift it now. 
Taran cast Ordu a distrustful glance, but he ventured to put his weight against the Kraken. It moved, he discovered, too, and his hands were free. With much labor, the companions managed to raise the heavy Kraken and carry it from the chicken roost. Outside, the sun had already risen. As the companions set the cauldron on the ground and quickly drew away from it, the rays of dawn turned the black iron as red as blood. Yes, now, as I was saying, Ordu continued, while Taren and his companions rubbed their aching arms and hands, we've talked it over, and we agree, even Orgosh agrees. You shall have the Kraken if you truly want it. You mean you'll let us take it? cried Taren. After all you've done? Quite so, replied Ordu. The Kraken is useless, except for making cauldron born. Arwen has spoiled it for anything else, as you might imagine. It's sad it should be so, but that's the way things are. Now, I assure you, Cauldronborn are the last creatures in the world that we should want around here. We've decided the Kraken is nothing but a bother to us. And since you're friends of Dalvin, you're giving us the Kraken? Taryn began in astonishment. Delighted to oblige you, ladies, said the bard. <laughs> gently, gently, my ducklings, Ordu interrupted. Give you the Kraken? <laughs> oh, goodness, no. We never give anything. Only what is worth earning is worth having. But we shall allow you the opportunity to buy it. We have no treasures to bargain with, Taryn said in dismay. Alas, that we do not. Well, we couldn't expect you to pay as much as Arwen did, replied Ordu, but we're sure you can find something to offer in exchange. Oh, shall we say maybe the North Wind in a bag? The North Wind, Taryn exclaimed. That's impossible. I mean, how could you ever dream of... Oh, very well, said Ordu. We shan't be difficult then. How about the South Wind? It's much gentler. You're making fun of us, Taryn cried angrily. The price you're asking is beyond what any of us can pay. Ordu hesitated. Hmm. Possibly you're right, she admitted. Well then, perhaps something a little more personal. Oh, I have it, she said, beaming at Taryn. Why don't you give us the nicest summer day you can remember? You can't say that's hard since it belongs to you. Yes, said Orwen eagerly. A lovely summer afternoon, full of sunlight, sunlight and sleepy scents. There's nothing so sweet, murmured Orgosh, as a tender young lamb summer afternoon. Well, how can I give you that, protested Taryn, or any other day of mine when they're inside of me somehow? I mean, you can't just get them out, I mean... We could try, Orgosh muttered. Or do sighed patiently. Ah, very well, my goslings. We've made our suggestions and now we're willing to listen to yours. But mind you, it has to be a fair exchange. It has to be something that you prize as much as the Kraken. Well, I, I prize my sword, Taryn said. It's a gift from Dalvin, and it's the first blade that's truly mine. For the Kraken, I would gladly part with it. He began to unbuckle his belt, but Ordu waved an uninterested hand. Ugh, a sword, she answered, shaking her head. Ugh, goodness no, my duck. We already have so many of those, too many, in fact. And some of them are famous weapons of mighty warriors. Well then, Taryn said with hesitation, I offer you Luger. She's a noble animal. He paused, seeing Ordu's frown. Or, he added in a low voice, there is my own horse, Melonless, the colt of Melangar, Prince Gwydion's own steed. No horse is faster or more sure-footed. I treasure Melonless beyond all others. Ah, uh, horses, said Ordu. Mm, no, that wouldn't do at all. <laughs> Such a bother feeding them and caring for them and Besides, with Orgosh around, it's difficult to keep a pet. <sighs> what would Orgosh do to them? <laughs> she would eat them, of course. Taryn was silent for a moment. 
His face paled as he thought about Adon's brooch, and his hand went protectively to it. Well, all that remains to me, he began slowly. No, no, Gurgi cried, thrusting his way to the enchantresses and holding out his wallet. Take Gurgi's own tre true treasure. Take his bag of crunchings and munchings. Mm, not food, said Ordu. That won't do either. The only one of us who has the slightest interest in food is Orgosh, <laughs> and I'm sure your wallet holds nothing to tempt her. Gurgi looked at Ordu in dismay. But that is all poor Gurgi has to give. He held out the wallet once again. The enchantress smiled and shook her head. Gurgi's hands fell to his side and his shoulders drooped, and he turned mournfully away. Oh, you know, you must like jewelry, Ellen, we put in quickly. She pulled the ring from her finger and she offered it to Ordu. This is a lovely thing, Helen, we said. Prince Gwydion gave it to me. Do you see the stone? It was carved by the fair folk. Ordu took the ring. She held it close to her eye and she squinted. Mm, lovely, lovely, she said. So pretty, almost as pretty as you, my lamb but so much older. No, I'm afraid not. We have a number of those two and we just don't want any more. Keep it, my chick. One day you may find some use for it, but we surely won't. She gave the ring back to Eleni, who sadly replaced it on her finger. I do have something else that I treasure, Eleni went on. She reached into the folds of her cloak and she brought out the golden sphere. Here, she said, turning it in her hands so that it shone with a bright light. It's much better than just a light, Emily said. You see things in it differently, clearer somehow. It's, it's very useful. Oh, mm, how sweet of you to offer it to us, said Ordu. But there again, it's something we really don't need. Ladies, ladies, cried Fluter. You've overlooked a most excellent bargain. He stepped forward and unslung his harp. I quite understand that bags of food and all such things couldn't possibly interest you, but I ask you, consider this harp. You know, you're all alone in this gloomy fen of yours, he said. You know, a little music might be just the thing. The harp almost plays by itself, Fluter continued. He put the beautifully curved instrument to his shoulders and he barely touched the strings and a long and lovely melody filled the air. You see, cried the bard, nothing to it. Oh, that is nice, Orwen murmured wistfully. And think of the songs we could sing to keep ourselves company. Ordu peered closely at the harp. Hmm, I notice a good many of the strings are badly knotted. Has the weather gotten to them? Well, no, not exactly the weather, <laughs> said the bard. You know, with me, they, they tend to break frequently, but only when I uh, color the facts a bit. I'm sure you ladies wouldn't have any kind of trouble like that. Well, I can understand why you should prize it, Ordu said. But you know, if we want music, we can just send for a few birds. No, all things considered, it would just be a nuisance, you know, keeping it tuned and so on. Are you certain you have nothing else? Orwen asked hopefully. Well, that's all, said the disappointed bard. Absolutely everything. I mean, unless you want the cloaks off of our own backs. Oh, bless you, no, said Ordu. It wouldn't be proper in the least for you ducklings to go on without them. You'd perish in the cold. And then what good would the crocken be to you then? I'm terribly sorry, my chicks, Ordu went on. It does indeed seem you have nothing to interest us. Very well. We shall keep the crocken, and you shall be on your way. That's the end of chapter 14. Does Taryn have anything else that he could bargain with? We'll read more soon. Thanks for joining in Wool School.